The Last of Us is a game that's meant to feel post-apocalyptic, but never have I felt the absence of humans more than when playing a game that's been truly abandoned by its players. You see, we all have games that we used to love that just aren't played anymore. And that's not a bad thing. New games are being made every day that pull players away from the old and into the new. One day you're tapping in Flappy Bird and the next you're tapping people's heads in CS. It's the cycle of life. But sometimes you get the urge to go back. Step away from the flashy new titles with their photorealistic graphics and rays being traced, exciting new systems and massive, frankly overwhelming open worlds and return to a time when things were more simple. And in most cases, that's easy to do. If it's a single player game, chances are it's pretty easy to either play your old copy or emulate a perfect replica of the game within a matter of minutes. You probably even have your old game saved, so you can literally continue right where you left off and dive right into the timeless nostalgia. But some games don't have that luxury. Sure, you can still play them, and the game's still there, but it's missing one crucial aspect the people. These games exist in a haunting limbo where the game and its world are still there for you to explore, but each turn feels empty and lifeless despite the world being intact. These cities were meant to be filled with adventurers eager to conquer the game's end bosses. These battlefields were meant to be etched with the scars of constant conflict, silent only in the lulls between skirmishes. But now these worlds stand eerily silent. These cities are desolate, their inhabitants reduced to NPCs maintaining their posts with robotic diligence, patiently awaiting players who never arrive. These battlefields find themselves in ironically pristine conditions, untouched by the horrors of war they yearn to witness. And in the darkest corner of all, Robert Barron sits in his Toontown Tower, wondering when he'll have the next comically large pie thrown in his face. I'm sorry, it got a little dark there. And yet there's a certain beauty in this stillness, a dystopian aura that offers a feeling of loneliness that's hard to experience in the modern age of constant interaction. It's hard not to feel sad when revisiting these games lost to time, but it's equally as easy to find joy in solitude and remembrance. Today, we'll explore these abandoned games, all games that I once loved as a kid. And sure, I could go on Steam and find games that were never really played or marketed. There are bound to be thousands of games on Steam that no one is playing at all. But today, I'm going to explore games that once had vibrant communities. Games that were once filled with life and with hope. Some were abandoned by their players, some were abandoned by their developers, and some were abandoned by both. And as we continue, the games will become more and more destitute until we finally reach once beloved games that are now truly played by no one at all. Growing up, I first got hooked on gaming through children's MMOs. I mean, yeah, I shared a song and dance with Freddy Fish, and I played cool math games in class when my teacher was looking somewhere else, but nothing got me hooked like a good old-fashioned MMO. I mean, it was a perfect concept. You take the MMO genre, known for their sweaty, Dorito-covered fan bases, their testosterone-filled calls of Leroy Jenkins, and their painfully toxic communities, and you offer that same sweaty toxicity to children. What could go wrong? But as it turns out, it was a better fit than you would have initially thought. Games like Club Penguin, Toontown, Wizard 101, they all flourished despite being catered to a younger audience. For me, it was exactly what I was looking for as a kid. These were games that had incredible scale for the time with massive worlds that would take ages to uncover. They had quests, activities, bosses, loot, everything I needed to keep my nine-year-old brain full to the brim with dopamine. But while that was great, it was the players that brought the game to life. Running around these games during their peak was an incredible feeling. You could walk up to anyone on the street, start jumping, and they'd immediately start jumping back. The universal sign for yes in MMOs. I mean, it's also the universal sign for no and stop and come join my guild, Meraki, we have candy, but that's a dark story for another time. Players would walk up to help you out while you fought for your life in the streets of Toontown, while you argued with professors in the spiral, or while you absolutely tore up the dance floor in Club Penguin. I mean, look at those moves. Look at that penguin. The life brought to these games by the spontaneity of human interaction made them impossible to put down, and it spawned a new age of MMO addicts, and I was right there with them. But these games wouldn't all stand the test of time. Club Penguin went from having over 200 million registered accounts at its peak to being 
cast aside in 2017 to make way for Disney's new focus on mobile gaming. Next door, Toontown players declined sharply until the game was shuttered in 2013. Wizard 101 put up a much better fight and still a fantastic game to this day with active development and new features being added on a regular basis, but it's no secret that the fan base is a fraction of what it once was. These games all dwindled, but Wizard 101 is still kicking, and Toontown and Club Penguin were killed rather than being given the dignity of a natural death. These were the first games I played where I felt the player base shrink over the years. It was depressing, and I was starting to realize how empty these games would feel without all their players, but they never really reached the point of abandonment. Much like a Clean Prince gaming video title, these games didn't die, they were murdered. But there's much more to the story here, so we'll come back to these games later. After seeing the heights of these once great MMOs, I was eager to try the real deal. I was born too late to play Vanilla WoW, born too early to play Star Citizen's final release, but born just in time to enjoy the best niche Tolkien-inspired MMO known to man. Lotro. The Lord of Rings Online is an incredible game, and it's probably my favorite game of all time. Released in 2007, it set out to ride the hype train from World of Warcraft and combine that with the hype train from Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings movies. I found the game back in 2010 via a banner ad, and I was immediately Hooked. My brother and I hopped in game and immediately leveled up to the soft cap of level 20, with him playing a captain in the footsteps of Boromir and me, naturally, playing a hunter in the footsteps of Legolas. And though I had seen the movies at this point, I was still too young to appreciate the beauty of Tolkien's world until I saw it laid out in that game. And it changed my perception of video games forever. I saw hundreds of players running through the Shire delivering pies to hobbits, joining together to fight foes we couldn't handle on our own. It was some of the most fun I've ever had playing games, and it was all thanks to both a beautiful game adaptation and a persistent, spontaneous, and flourishing player base. I mean, it's not a perfect game. The UI looks like it was drawn by a toddler. The game lags like you're playing it on a toaster, even when you're powering it with a literal spaceship. But despite its flaws, it felt alive. Combining a beautifully articulated world with enthusiastic fans and thousands of hours of content was nirvana for me. I, I knew I had found a game that I could keep playing for decades. And so Lotro remained a game that I would stay tied to forever. After playing for years, I eventually worked up the courage to ask my parents for a VIP subscription, and I leveled all the way up to the level cap of Rohan. I didn't play constantly, but I'd always step in every year or two for a small, addiction-filled month, similar to how I start a new Minecraft server or a new Skyrim playthrough every few years. But unlike in Skyrim and Minecraft, each year got a little more lonely. It was hard for me to realize because it happened slowly over time, but bit by bit the game I loved the most was dying right in front of me. I used to run through Bree and barely be able to see my character between the mash of players around me, but now it was a ghost town. My friends list became an obituary section with a list of all these great players I had once shared so many memories with, accompanied by the time and place they were last online. And look, I realize that it's just a game and that I was at home with my loving family at the time, but the feeling of loneliness I experienced in that first epiphanic moment was crippling. I opened the social menu to see where everyone was. Maybe the server was meeting in an unorthodox area. Maybe I just had to go somewhere else. But upon opening the window, I was met with a hollowing phrase, zero players online. I was sitting in this once vibrant game fully alone. It was as if some plague had wiped out the once thriving world of Middle Earth, leaving me behind in this dystopian landscape. But with this haunting feeling was another sensation, a tinge of excitement. I was the only sentient being online. All the rare enemies were mine to fell alone. All the loot belonged only to me. I was the most powerful person on the server, and I had armies of NPCs simply waiting for me and no one else. I was playing God. And it was beautiful. Without players to distract, I was able to soak in the beauty of the game's incredible translation of Middle Earth and immerse myself in a gaming experience that was mine alone. But the feeling was hollow. Happiness is only real when it's shared. I, I was powerful, I had the beautiful world at my whim, but for what? I couldn't show off my new armor to people passing by, no one would care about the rare mounts I was riding. I couldn't even play the end game content designed for groups. The once vibrant world of Middle Earth was dulled by the loss of its vibrant players. And though on the surface it looked the same, the lack of players quickly turned it into a depressing hellscape I couldn't bear to be in. The game I once loved was still there on paper, but 
In reality, it really wasn't. I stood there in the southern gates of Bree, once the most populated area in the entire game. But without players playing music or crafting or emoting or simply existing, I realized that it was a strikingly ugly area. My mood had swung entirely and the game was leaving a bitter taste in my mouth. I logged off and I wasn't sure when I would log back in. But thankfully there's more to that story and my young self was just being a bit of an idiot. Like many classic MMOs, Lotro operated on servers and I had picked one that had a cool name. Now that is a sound theory in the mind of an 11 year old, but much less effective in practice. Apparently it wasn't even that cool of a server name because I can't for the life of me remember what it was actually called. And all this time, unknown to me, the few large guilds, known as Kinships and Lotro, had moved their players to Arkenstone and Brandywine, which were the larger servers. That day that I experienced fully alone, I was playing at a weird time and I was playing during a long content drought. In reality, the game wasn't actually dead, but my server was definitely on life support and those events all combined to give me that eerie, lonely experience. But when I found myself missing that game I thought had died a year later, I found the Lotro subreddit. I thought maybe there would be people talking about it, reminiscing about the days when people still played the game. But it turns out that the developers had rearranged the servers to consolidate players, and I could now move my characters to a new server for free. So I quickly did exactly that, and I moved all my old characters onto one of the fresh new servers. I hit the login button, and I waited with bated breath. And there I was, right where I had logged off in the ugly gates of South Bree. And immediately I saw players jumping, signaling one of 200 messages. I saw players playing Eye of the Tiger on their lutes and arguing to death about whether you put peanut butter or the jam on your PB&Js first. I was surrounded by idiots and I felt right at home. God, that must say something about me. But Lotro was always a smaller game and it wasn't abandoned by its developers, it was abandoned by the majority of its players. To find a more haunting experience, we have to dig a little deeper. What happens when a game that was once the most played game on planet Earth falls from grace? The first shooter I was ever allowed to play was Black Ops 1. It was a great game and I definitely loved it, but I did play it entirely on the Wii. And I'm not sure if you've seen that console, but I think forcing it to run a vulgar game like Black Ops left it with some permanent trauma that it's probably still working through in therapy somewhere. But even with my mixed first step into Call of Duty, I knew I was living in the golden age of shooters. All my friends who were already armed with Xboxes were playing Modern Warfare 2, and I even watched some older brothers obsessed with Battlefield's Bad Company 2. Back in the day, these shooters were all anyone played. They were all anyone talked about at recess. I mean, aside from me in the corner talking about elf ears to a very receptive wall, but even I couldn't fend off the obsession for long. My first real Call of Duty was Modern Warfare 3. And man, I put some good old fashioned playtime into that game. I could recount to you each bend of each map, each kill streak and how OP it was, each weapon and its best attachment. Hell, I could sit you down and give you an hour long overview of the I Raw Instinct and I Fly Illini drama from back in the day. But again, the real memories here were with the people. Random people in voice chat, my friends in their Xbox parties, my brother playing split screen with me. Being a part of this golden age was incredible and some of my fondest childhood memories are from these years. But as time moved on, new Call of Duties kept getting churned out and the quality was not as consistent. My friends became less interested in gaming and I became interested in other games. And as the years moved on, I made new friends and I lost touch with a lot of my best friends from my childhood with a few exceptions. And these old shooters were not built to stand the test of time. They were built to be replaced every year or so, to be deprecated when the new and improved version came out. And while it was an incredible time due to the sheer quality and innovation of these games, it's no surprise that the golden age was fleeting. With player bases surging, the companies turned to greed, leading to a decline in quality that would persist for the next decade or so. And the combination of these factors meant I turned to other games entirely. I got my competitive shooter fix in Counter-Strike and Overwatch, and despite still trying the new CODs as they came out, I never played another like I did back in the day. And as those years dragged on, I began to miss those golden years more and more. And so with my Xbox long gone, I decided to buy the game on Steam and try to hop right back into the era I remembered so fondly. I booted up the game and the nostalgia hit me like a wave. It's funny how something as simple as the music you hear in the lobbies can cause memories to flood back. I felt like I was a kid again and I couldn't wait to dive back into the game. But even on the landing screen, I saw remnants of the game being abandoned. Just below all the options was an advertisement for the new Call of Duty. 
the new Call of Duty that was released in 2014. On one hand, it made me sad. The game that I once loved so much hadn't been touched since 2014. But on the other hand, here was a perfect time capsule back to that year. It was going to be exactly like I remembered it. But I hit play, and another reminder of the game's abandonment hit me in the face. The map of online players used to light up like a Christmas tree. A sentiment to the legions of players all enjoying the game at the same time as you. Now the map of the world looked post-apocalyptic, and opening the server browser was even more depressing. The player count, which was a bold count for Call of Duty to display publicly and a testament to just how dominant they were back in the day, displayed just 328 online. Back in the day, this number would have been in the hundreds of thousands. And that stung a little, but I should still be able to find a game with that many players. So I searched for a game of domination, my favorite mode from back in the day. And I was instantly thrown into a loop. Searching for games, no games found. Searching for games, no games found. Even when I found a free-for-all lobby, we couldn't muster the four players needed to start the match. To be honest, this is what I expected, but it still stopped. This game, which once ruled the world, the best-selling game in 2011, beating FIFA, Skyrim, Battlefield, this game now lay in a graveyard caused by a mix of greed and time. But I still wanted to experience the game I once loved. So defeated, I headed to create my own private match. And there I stood in the middle of Dome, the poster child map for the game. A map usually so crowded with players, you couldn't turn a corner without meeting the wrong end of a shotgun. A map that felt like Times Square in the middle of summer, like a sold out concert where you couldn't find space to breathe. A map that felt like classic WoW servers on launch day. But today, I was alone. I walked around the map, still eager to remind myself of the good old days. And just like clockwork, that same ambivalent feeling began to set in. The feeling was mostly lonely. I was feeling hollow, I was missing the excitement and joy of playing alongside my childhood friends and the feeling of collective enjoyment that existed so perfectly in 2011. Memories rushed through my head of playing at friends' houses and whispers of conversations I loosely remembered over voice chat. And those memories clashed with the emptiness I was witnessing with my very eyes in a painful way. It was like coming to terms with the fact that my childhood was over. And as I sat there, as the virtual wind whipped through my ears, it really set in. I'd never play Modern Warfare 3 with my friends ever again. I'd never truly relive those memories. And again, through the pain, there was a tinge of something else. There was a beauty in the stillness of being alone in a game that was once so overrun by players. I mean, sure, being in a private lobby is something I could have done back in the game's peak, but being forced into a private match because there weren't enough players to support an actual game was a whole different feeling entirely. Here I sat, the singular green dot in Vermont, alone in Dome. Without players, I noticed details about the map I never would have before. I felt the same feeling of excitement that I felt when I realized I was alone in Lotra. Modern Warfare, once the titan of gaming, the definitive game of 2011 by all sales metrics, now reduced to ashes. And here I stood, my invisible feet in the sand, still experiencing the game over a decade later. Once I was one of millions, and now I stood alone. But even though Modern Warfare 3's best days are behind it, and even though it's a lot more confusing because I now have to refer to it as Modern Warfare 3 2011, there's still more to the game's story here. But again, we'll get to that later. First, I wanna share one final tale of abandonment, the worst tale of all. This is a massive, ambitious, and storied game that once had the entire MMO community watching. A game I once thought to be the best game I had ever played, and a game that now averages just 19 players on Steam. The Tale of Arcage is a sad one, and it's one worth knowing if you're a fan of games. Arcage first released in 2013 in Korea and came to Western markets a year later. It was led by a former lineage creator, Jake Song, and it had one of the most open, open worlds ever seen in an MMO. To start, there were three player factions engaged in an all-out persistent war. You had the Eastern factions, the Western factions, and a third secret pirate faction for the cool kids. And of course, with that pirate faction, there was this sprawling ocean between the two continents that you could literally sail across with ships that you built from materials you gather. Across the world, players could build houses, farms, 
Even castles, which they could use to both bolster their factions in war and facilitate trade across regions. One thing I used to love doing was making these trade packs and putting them in a tractor I had built from scratch and then driving that tractor slowly across regions in exchange for a tiny amount of gold. It was kind of like playing truck simulator, except the whole time I ran the risk of being assaulted by players. But of course, if I was attacked, I could report their crimes and we'd both be given a court date where we'd actually go to a physical court, be tried in front of a jury of our peers, and if they were found guilty, they'd go to jail. In real life. And that is just a taste of the depth that the game offered. And its systems really worked. You pair that with the usual MMO jazz of gearing systems, my favorite class design to date, world bosses, dungeons, PVPs, and you could see what made the game so special. They managed to create a cozy and approachable game that at the same time had the depth of a game like Dwarf Fortress, all with that magical MMO backdrop. And of course, the game was held together by Farm Life One, the most incredible piece of video game music ever recorded. I mean, God, that's good stuff. The game launched to positive reviews with reviewers loving the innovation that they were bringing to the genre and the sheer size of the sprawling world they had created. And I was right there with them. I played at launch, I, I played up to the max level and I had an incredible time. I built a house, I built a ship, I built a kick-ass tractor. I mean, if that's not peak gaming, I do not know what is. But of course, the highlight of the game was seeing how full of life the world was. There were thousands of players engaging in naval warfare, building illegal farms and hidden parts of the map, and there was my stupid ass driving a tractor for four real life hours in exchange for a tiny handful of gold. It was truly a special time in gaming, but sadly, you had to be there to experience Arcage's fleeting success. Soon after release, the game's player base began to fall rapidly. Rather than continuing on the incredible base game they had built, driving organic growth and implementing fair subscription pricing, the developers quickly saw that they could make a lot of money by catering to the wealthiest gamers. Every MMO's worst enemy, the whales. And so Arcage fell to greed. They made the game pay to win. If you had enough money, you could make yourself a god amongst men, literally one-shotting people and taking no damage yourself. I mean, sure, it was expensive to do that, but all it took was for one person to take the bait and the game was ruined for everyone else. And sure, they made a lot of money by making the game pay to win, but they would have made a whole lot more if they just had the common sense to look beyond their next fiscal quarter. By making the game pay to win, the game loses its sense of equality, and there's suddenly no reason to put in the hours to get better if someone can go work a shift at McDonald's and buy a better sword than the one that took you weeks to get. As soon as a game becomes pay to win, the community abandons it, and when the whales realize they can no longer be stronger than the dirty plebeian player base, they end up leaving too. To me, it is an incredibly obvious pitfall, but it never seems to stop developer after developer from throwing away all their hard work in exchange for a quick buck. And so within a year or so, the game was nearly gone. The player base had left the game behind, and I had too. And eventually, the developers gave up as well. After a while, the original publishers were bought by a new studio. And thankfully, these new guys saw the potential of Arcage, and they thought that it deserved a second chance, a chance to do things the right way. I mean, this new studio had a great track record. Okay, decent. Okay, passable. Okay, average. All right, fine, it was bad. So four years after the initial release of Arcage, they announced the release of Arcage Unchained with a buy-to-play model and no pay-to-win systems. They promise. But despite it looking suspicious from the very start, I leapt at the opportunity to relive the glorious heyday of Arcage. And it was incredible. The world felt alive, and not only that, but the developers had actually added a few cool things since the last time I played. The game was everything I remembered it being, and the world was once again filled with a dedicated player base. It was an incredible time, until, in the blink of an eye, it wasn't. It turns out, Maybe you can remove the pay to win from Arcage, but you can't remove the systems that enforce pay to win without restructuring the game from the ground up. And so the once hopeful world of Arcage Unchained was quickly revealed to be a beautiful husk for a deeply broken game. And I played for about a month, trying to deny the inevitability that the game was dying as I played it. I watched as the trade routes ground to a halt, as the houses became abandoned, as battles between factions diminished from all out war to a few players slapping each other around outside the town square. Every day, fewer players logged on, giving up on this once great game. 
And soon after, I joined them. But as I wrote this script, Arcage kept popping into my head. It really was the most freedom I ever felt in an MMORPG, and the original systems of PvP, farming, housing, exploration, hell, even the jury duty made the world seem so incredibly alive. Because of how the game was so reliant on having an active player base, I knew it would be especially depressing to go back. But then again, that's what this video is all about. So I reinstalled the game. And I couldn't remember the email address I used to create my account, but that's okay because I can contact support. But support doesn't exist. Eventually I figured out that the game had changed hands and I had to find a line of text that was emailed to me two years ago in order to get my account transferred to the new owners. But finally, I installed the game and I hit play. I was excited to finally hop in and oh my god, what the fuck. I was a little off put by my character's absolute beak, but I decided to hop in regardless. And I had to pick a new name, so naturally I entered PogChamp. Of course, that was taken, so I tried a variation. And we were off. I spawned in the middle of the literal ocean, which in a way kind of felt fitting. I looked around to get my bearings and decided I was gonna try and find another player to interact with. Thankfully, I had built a boat back in the day, so I didn't end up drowning. And instantly, I remembered why this game felt so freeing to play. Eventually, I landed in a player housing area, one where I had actually built my first house way back in 2014. It was definitely way less full than it typically would be, but to be honest, I was impressed with the number of houses regardless. And some of the crops looked fresh, so clearly the game wasn't fully abandoned. And though World Chat was nearly dead, there was one person talking to themselves, like actually talking to an imaginary person because they seemed to be having half of a conversation. But now that I was on land, it was obvious what I had to do. I summoned the tractor and boy, I was ready to move across Arcage's map at a moderate pace. When I came to the first town, it was obviously abandoned. I mean, the guards were there and they were seemingly excited to see a player, but it was lifeless. Empty public transport, empty housing districts, empty towns. So far the game was a ghost town, but I was determined. So I set off to find signs of real life. I came to another housing district, but this one was equally empty. There were packs here for trade, meaning someone had actually been online to make them, but I noticed that they were all made by the same player. And suddenly that player appeared. My heart was pounding out of my chest. I forgot how to talk to people. I was nervous to talk to another player and I was excited that he had appeared. I stood in front of him and I knew what I had to do. I started jumping. It said he was away, but maybe with enough jumps, I could summon him back to life. And I tried everything. I ran around, I begged, I jumped until my legs were sore in real life, but I couldn't change it. He wasn't there, he was a husk, just like the game we were playing. And so I took off. After passing another empty housing district with an alarming number of baby goats outside it, I decided to go to an area that I knew from back in the day. This was an end game town that was always packed with people. But after jumping through the portal, I found the town empty. So I flew around. My eyes were like a hawk, looking for the first sign of a player. And after 10 years, the game was starting to show its age, but I was still impressed with the beauty. With no players there to incentivize interaction, all my attention was drawn to the environment. And in the stillness, it was breathtaking. But I wasn't ready to give up because I still had a few more tricks up my sleeve. First, I decided to take a portal to the marketplace realm, which was traditionally one of the most populated areas in the game. And to my surprise, there were four people waiting for me, but none were actually online. And after looking at their names, three of them seemed to be the same person. But I decided to sit and wait, watching for any movement like a lion stalking its prey. And soon, we had liftoff. I took off like a cheetah, leaping on my glider and chasing them down. I hadn't been this determined to make a new friend since the first day of college. And as I flew through the air, matching their every move in perfect synchronicity, I caught a glimpse of another player on the horizon. And I got nervous because this could be a gold mine. I might have an actual friend group on my hands. But after finally catching up with them, they didn't seem to acknowledge me. I jumped, but oddly, didn't get a jump in return. I ran around for minutes trying to get them to do anything in response to me. And just when I was starting to believe I was a ghost, I got healed. This healing was a peace treaty. I had taken some damage in the fall and he had noticed. I think that makes us best friends. And so with the ice broken, I decided to say hello. And instantly they ran away. Suddenly I was alone again. And at this point I was feeling pretty defeated. So I went back to town. There was one last place I wanted to check, the courtroom. 
If anyone was actually playing the game and not just sitting AFK waiting for the servers to close, there would be people in the courtroom. It doesn't matter who you are, in Arcage, you can't outrun the law. And so I teleported into the capital city. And funnily enough, I met the same group as before. Once again, I tried to say hi and I was met with familiar rejection. So I decided to stop dilly-dallying and take things to court. This town was actually filled with players, but again, no one was actually playing the game. They all sat around looking directly through me as if they were waiting for the rapture. But eventually I found my way to the courthouse based solely on muscle memory. Oh, you're wondering how I know where the courthouse is despite not playing the game for years? Yeah, I was a bit of a badass back in the day. But as I arrived, my suspicions were confirmed. I mean, sure, there were people who were still logged on. And sure, there was a group of exclusionary bullies on the loose, but in reality, no one was actually playing Arcage. It was reduced to a shell, a piece of digital archaeology that you could see, but not touch. And so I sat there, heart bubbles forming above my head for some reason, and I felt depressed. I mean, sure, I felt the feeling of dystopia, and I witnessed that this game was still beautiful in its stillness, but Arcage was never a game that reached its potential. It wasn't revitalized like Lotro. It wasn't simply past its glory days like Modern Warfare 3. It was a game that had failed again and again. A series of flawed systems built up into a house of cards that had fallen. Arcage was dead, and I was simply looking at its tombstone in the cemetery. One of the worst things that can happen for a game you love is for it to be abandoned. But the bright side is, if there's a game out there that you love, there are others that love it too. Which means, even if the developers give up on the game, the community might still have its back. At the start, we talked about Toontown, which was a game that I loved as a kid. But sadly, Disney gave up on it, and the servers went offline in 2013, meaning the game couldn't ever be played again as you needed servers to even launch the game's world. At least that was the case, until a group of fans decided to take the original assets and rewrite them back into existence in a free-to-play, non-profit version that's even better than the original. Thanks to fan dedication, you can go experience Toontown today for free, and with a much healthier community than it ever had in its dying years. And the same is true for Club Penguin, which was also killed by Disney back in 2017. Fans rewrote the game back into existence, made it free to play, and now it has a healthy community once again. Even Modern Warfare 3, which was abandoned by its developers, found its savior in its fan base. The fans developed a mod that overhauls matchmaking and progression on PC. Within minutes, I was able to join a full match, complete with a nostalgic cacophony of children hurling insults. Here tries, good. But while it's definitely a great thing that these games that would have otherwise been lost to time have been saved by fans, a part of me still likes to go back and wander through truly abandoned games. Sometimes it hurts to find a game you once loved has been deserted. But sometimes exploring a world meant for millions by yourself is an experience that takes away the pain entirely and leaves you with a new appreciation for the absurdity of video games altogether. Aww.